SABC News Presentation. Good evening and welcome to Interface. My name is Rems Mabote. The Constitution guarantees the independence of the judiciary and makes it mandatory for all South Africans to access justice. But is justice accessible to all? How has our judiciary fared in ensuring this? this? Retired Judge Bernard Nguyep is our guest tonight. You may join this discussion. Comment on our Facebook page, Interface on SABC3, or send a text message to 33726. Good evening, Mr. Justice Nguyep. Good evening. I thought we should first dispense with the fact that you, you just got retired. And I, I was fascinated looking at your resume and realized that your career as an attorney in the Supreme Court of South Africa started on the 15th of June, 1976, one day before that big day. Well, that is indeed so. It's quite a long time ago. But yes, I got admitted as an attorney then on that date. And it has been a very wonderful 36 years? Well, yes, I'm happy with what I have been doing for the past 36 years because I myself chose the profession. I followed uh, the various paths um, that were ahead of me, and uh, I'm happy I did so. I have no regrets about it. Let's just focus a bit on, on your, your last uh, 13 years as Judge President of the High Court of South Africa in the North and South of Houting. You found a, a white office when you walked in, and just during that time of early days of transition in South Africa, how did you cope with, that, with, that, with the challenges, and what, what were the, the highlights of your time in the in the high court well, well indeed there were some challenges that i found there as you say a white of a white bench and uh, one of the challenges that i was faced with was to make sure that the the court was as representative as possible and may i say in this respect that by the way when i got appointed judge president i was the only black judge in pretoria and there was only one black judge in johannesburg and therefore uh, when I became judge president, there was actually no black judge left on the floor. So one of my tasks was to try and make sure that the bench was as representative as possible. And uh, we have gone some distance, distance now. But of course, you don't do all those things all by yourself. You get the support of colleagues, you get the support of other institutions, and so on and so forth. When we promoted the, the show earlier in the week and told everybody that we we're going to be talking to you, we got an SMS from... A Tsepo uh, Manaswe, who says that it's very well of you to speak about transformation in your court, but he says in the court that you led, it was actually judge, uh, the deputy uh, judge, Fanamerve, who was still in charge and not you. Well, nobody can run such a big court alone. Remember, when we speak of the North and South Outing High Courts now, we are taking over 80 judges. So, in fact, I'm assisted by two deputy judges president precisely because you cannot run that court alone. You've got to delegate some of the duties to, to your colleagues, even ordinary judges. And um, you don't pick your deputies. They are appointed by, by the Judicial Service Commission. And uh, I accept anybody who comes to help me. It doesn't matter whether he's a Fanamere or a Mujapelo or Mabote. I don't pick judges president. And I have complete faith in all my colleagues, be they men or women, be they white or whatever. Let's stick to the issue of transformation. At, at, your, at your farewell, Chief Justice Mokwe Mokweng was quoted as saying, transformation is no longer about appointing black people and women to the judiciary. There are added factors. But I'm sure that transformation on racial basis still matters a lot in this country. It still matters, except that we shouldn't get too obsessed with it. But it is still very important. And... Um, we, I think, especially at my two courts, Pretoria and Johannesburg, as I left them, um, more than 50% of the judges were people of color. Well, they, were, they, are, they are women, but they are not nearly as many as we would have liked them to be, but they are women. So I, I, I think that um, we have gone some distance, and that statement should be understood in that context. And the quality of our judges, because some people then say transformation always impacts the quality. Oh, yes, th that is so. I think the ideal thing is, of course, to make the court as representative as possible without compromising quality. And I don't spend any sleepless nights about that because uh, it's not a, a, an issue. Well, sometimes, as it should happen, when human beings are 
are involved with any project, such as appointing judges. Here and there, you may make a mistake and, and make a weak appointment. But uh, that would be more of an, of an exception than the rule. So generally, I'm quite happy with the quality of the judges we have. There has been a feeling, and there's been studies to show that trust in our courts in South Africa has is, is been declining over the years. Although it shows that black people, though, have more confidence in the, in the courts post-1994 than before 1994. Is that your observation, too? Yes and no. First, I don't think there's been a decline in the confidence, uh, the confidence that the populace have in our courts. On the contrary, I think there's been a fantastic increase in the confidence that the people have in the courts, particularly if you consider where we come from. We come from a situation where people, especially the majority, absolutely had no confidence in the courts, no confidence in the administration of justice. But now, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that the bench is representative, I think people have got a lot of confidence in, in the administration of justice and in the judiciary. However, Mr. Justice, this confidence may be tempered by comments when we hear people saying the judiciary is either not independent or, or the judiciary tends to favor government. There's been a lot of, there's a lot of debate about political interference in the judiciary or with the judiciary. Well, I don't know what the debate is should be, whether there should be any debate at all, because I don't for once believe that any politician can successfully interfere with any judge. If that judge is to allow themselves to be interfered with by a politician, then they don't deserve to be on our bench. So um, I, I don't believe there's been that kind of, 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 inter of interference. And I believe that our judiciary is enjoying uh, independence, uh, which I think we all value. There may be people who for some reason or other are not satisfied with certain judgments, but that's the way life is. Sometimes you get what you want, sometimes you don't. And you may have to take your blame elsewhere other than to the judiciary. Uh, do, do you also feel that when people speak of the independence of, of the judiciary, the concern seems to be solely about the ANC or the ANC-led government? Um, well, it seems to me so in the sense that uh, perhaps not surprisingly, it is the ANC which is in government. When somebody in government speaks, people take that more seriously than someone who is not in power. But uh, personally, I don't see any reason why people should be worried about whatever any politician can say about the, as far as the independence of the judiciary is concerned. Uh, as I've said before, it is for the judges themselves to safeguard their independence. If a politician does something which undermines their independence, they should declare it unconstitutional. If parliament makes an act which undermines the independence of the judiciary, it is to the, for, up to the judges to declare that act uh, unconstitutional. So I fail to see in which way anybody can successfully undermine the independence of the judiciary. That can only happen if judges themselves don't do their work properly. So any comment made by a minister a, a politician, any other person should not matter as long as the judges themselves have, have the integrity and the independence. It That's should not say. matter at all. And sometimes, quite frankly... But shouldn't we worry when politicians make comments that seem to be interfering with the, in, with the judiciary? Uh, as, as I say personally, I don't know why we should worry about that because, because very often uh, such comments follow judgments with which people are not comfortable with. In that respect, it is not only politicians who criticize judges. It is people who don't get what they wanted, who begin to criticize the judges and the judiciary. We have had instances where people launched vicious attacks on, on individual judges. We, we'll go back to that because I want us to come back and talk about criticism of, of the judiciary. When we come back, we do, we're going to talk about that matter. 33726 is our SMS line, and we come back after this. <laughs> Welcome back. Our guest is Judge Bernard Mwepe, the retired judge of the uh, Supreme Court of uh, South Africa. Mr. Mwepe, I want us to talk about the, the issue of criticism of the judiciary. There seems to be two schools of thought out there. The one school of thought says the judges are very sensitive. They've got thin skins. They don't want to be criticized. And the other school of thought says that uh, people are over-criticizing the judiciary. Is the, ju is the judiciary too sensitive to criticism? Um, I, I wouldn't say so. In fact, I think the judiciary should welcome 
and does welcome constructive criticism. Uh, what, what could be worrying would be uninformed criticism, uh, which serves no purpose other than to disparage the, the judiciary, uh, other than to cause people to lose confidence, confidence in the judiciary. It is a very important institution, and we should be careful not to undermine its authority, because it's a pillar in our democracy. I've got Facebook comments here. We've asked people to send Facebook comments now. There's a comment here from, uh, there are three comments, by the way, on a subject that uh, you may have to comment on. Wanki Muerani says, spy tapes must be re revealed, and President Zuma and the NPA must be held in contempt of court. And Ben Tusofa uh, says, uh, the judiciary has been under attack while Judge Nwaipe didn't give guidance. Judges are being used as political pawns to please the master. South Africa needs judges who will be free from the ANC influence. I wait to hear Judge Nwaipe's opinion on spy tape saga. Do you have an opinion on the spy tape saga? I have no opinion, and uh, I shouldn't have an opinion, actually. And by the way, speaking of that, you, you may recall that uh, a few days ago, uh, the Sowetan reported that uh, I had expressed myself on that particular matter. I'm happy to say that the very following day, on my request, they agreed to, to take back that statement because I have never commented on that particular case. And in fact, I would never have commented on that, on that particular case because it is not only pending before court, it is in fact pending before the court which I presided over. So it would have been highly inappropriate for me to have commented on that. So that issue is buried. Let's revisit then the issue of access to courts. What are they? But I, I would have liked to comment on the other oh, on SMS about. Which one in particular? Um, uh, well, the political influence. Yes, on yes. the political, political influence. I, I, I asked the judge president. You don't prescribe to your judges how they must decide cases. Every single judge is independent and is appointed by the JSC on his or her own merit. Like I said before the commencement of this interview, uh, judges are appointed by the Judicial Service Commission. As judge president, you do not pick and choose who should be on your bench. They must appoint people of character and integrity and people of respectable intellect who will decide matters on their own, uninfluenced by anybody else. So I don't for once think that judges need the protection of the judge president in order to be able to give independent judgments. The, the, the JSE, JSC itself, by the way, is, is been criticized to, ha to not be as independent as it, it should be. Some, some quarters are saying that the JSC is tainted. So wouldn't that then lead to people thinking that the judiciary is not independent? Of well, it isn't. The, now that you, you talk about it, the JSC is not tainted. The JSC compresses people from various sectors. In fact, almost all political parties are represented in the JSC. The legal profession is represented. The judiciary is represented. And I believe that the method we have for identifying judges is the best, one of the best that, w that are there in the world. In other jurisdictions, appointments to the bench are done directly by the politicians without even input from, from, from other quarters. So I think the JSC is doing its best, and uh, they are handing down uh, the results, which are not easy but because it's not an easy task. But like I said, sometimes here and there, perhaps a weak appointment may be made. Let's talk about access to justice. The, we have an SMS here, and, and there are many other issues where people still say to us, only the rich have access to justice. The poor are excluded from justice. There is some truth in that, because uh, litigation in this country is, is very, very expensive. I may mention that sometime in the mid-80s, uh, on my visit to Geneva, uh, the, the offices of the Human Rights Commission there, um, mention was made of the fact that uh, in all the cases that they found all over the world, uh, justice was in South Africa very, very expensive. It is still the case. Um, so, indeed, the high costs of litigation are a problem. But uh, we need not despair because uh, there are other creative ways we can find in doing so. Please tell me about those. What, what are we doing to solve this well, these issues? Well, first we have to unpack this concept of access to justice because it's not just about finance. It's about having a bench or, 
or the judiciary, which is representative of the people, which must reflect uh, the population as it is. And you must also remember that uh, foreign uh, languages foreign to uh, the majority of people are being used in these courts. Maybe we should look into that. But you must also look into the structure. You have got to. F you may have to try physically to take the court to remote areas. You need more judges. You need more magistrates. So it's a host of factors that have a bearing on this whole exercise of access to justice. 18,000 cases in the financial year of 2011 and 2012 had not even gone through the, the courts. That backlog speaks to poor access to justice because if, if I'm awaiting trial and I have not even been heard for the whole year, that should not be speaking well of the judiciary. Yes, unfortunately, crime in our country is quite prevalent. You may be referring to other cases other than crime as well, granted. But let me say, again, it's a question of resources, uh, whether you have got enough infrastructure to accommodate all those cases. As I'm talking to you now, when I left office at the end of, of, of this past month, we didn't have enough chambers, offices for judges in Pretoria. We didn't have enough courtrooms. Uh, we're, in some instances, we're using the platoon system where one judge would go in in the morning and in the afternoon must uh, uh, vacate that particular courtroom so that another judge can use the same courtroom in the afternoon. So these are some of the challenges. You need more magistrates, you need more judges. It's a question of resources, it's a question of infrastructure. But really we need to do something about that. I'm just pointing out what could possibly be contributing to that kind of I'd backlog. like us to explore it more. But 33726 is our SMS line. When we come back, I'm going to read some of your SMSs in the Facebook comments. Welcome back. My guest tonight is Judge President, or at least retired Judge President, Bernard Mwape. Mwape. And we're taking your SMSs and your Facebook comments. Speaking of Facebook comments, and it's all the same subject of access, uh, Joanne Mayer. Mr. Chassis says, I commend those who avail themselves of voluntary legal services in representing poor rural communities who are often intimidated by the court systems. Yet there are still citizens who do not have access because of geographic location and socioeconomic reasons. And you spoke about this. What I'm still not feeling that we're dealing with is solving it. We, we, we both acknowledge there are issues and, and even the, 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 the SMSs or the comments are saying that. But what are we doing to solve it? Uh, well, um as regards the, the magistrate, at the magistrate level, um, I, I, I used to be the chairperson of the magistrate commission, I think for about 10 years, until two years ago. So I'm no longer conversant with issues around the magistracy, and I cannot speak up on that with some any authority. But let me speak about perhaps the court I know best, and that is obviously my own court. Um, I, th I think, uh, despite what I said earlier on, uh, with regards to resources. I can mention that uh, recently we, s we opened, about two, three years ago, we opened a permanent circuit court in Polokwane, and, um, which is now handling hearing matters on a, on a more regular basis. And I think it was all in the exercise of taking justice closer to the people because you'll remember people, for example, up at the border with Zimbabwe, uh, would have to come to Pretoria for a simple case at the High Court, but that court which we have, we have planted in Polokwane would be more accessible to them. Then again, uh, there is now a permanent court under, court under construction in Polokwane, which is almost complete, uh, which, when complete, will have at least 15 courtrooms, uh, and, and people will be able to use that court. Apart from that, in Pumalanga, which was, was also under my jurisdiction, um, we are in the process of establishing a court out there. And in fact, there's a bill uh, before Parliament, which will come out soon, hopefully, which tries to establish a high court in Limpopo, a high court in Mpumalanga as well. All this, if complete, uh, would be bringing justice closer to the people. So some things are being done, uh, even though sometimes we run into problems of being told that there are, there, there are no resources. Sexual violence in this country is a very serious issue. Uh, there are reported cases that, 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 that we are told that they've declined. Okay? However, the convictions have dropped. And that can give confidence to citizens of this country that 
as a woman sitting out there listening to this show now, and they've been told that the conviction rate uh, of, for sexual offences have dropped in the last financial year? Um, you know, um, there are many factors involved there. Uh, remember, for a start, anybody who is charged with any crime in this country, in terms of the Constitution, they are presumed innocent. So the state needs to prove that person guilty. So there may be a lot of challenges along the way towards that end. Uh, you may find that maybe the, wit wit the witnesses are not as, as good as they should be. Maybe the investigation by the police has not been good. And I don't want anybody tomorrow to come and quote me as saying that I blasted the police. I'm just saying that you may find that perhaps cases have not been properly investigated. There may be a host of other factors. So it's not as simple as all that. But, but is there an element, and there has been a survey, by the way, that shows that there's also a lack of understanding of how to handle these matters by some magistrates because of their delicate nature. So is there a need for retraining of some of our judicial officers to, to handle such delicate matters? There is always a need to train judicial officers. No judicial officer can pretend that they know nearly enough. That's why it's necessary to have continuous education. That's why uh, there is uh, this idea of establishing a judicial training institute and so on and so forth. Yes, certainly, uh, the, we do our best to train the magistrates upon their appointment. They are subjected to intensive training, but there's always room for improvement. These matters are not easy. You see, when, I, when, I, when somebody's watching us at home and, and they hear that they're not easy, the, the first thing that they're going to feel is despondency. They're going to feel, then things are not going to change. Because if, you, if you're telling me that these matters are not easy, and, and as we speak, somebody's being raped or being abused at home by their husband or their partner, they don't have the confidence then that there would be one of the 18,000 people who would be sitting there with a case that's not being heard. They need not be despondent. Because by saying that they are not easy, I'm not saying that uh, criminals should be let to go free. I'm saying that they need a concerted effort to be properly handled, properly investigated, and properly prosecuted. It, it, it cannot be easy to find anybody guilty, can it? And it shouldn't be. So because the state needs to prove that person guilty. So we can't live in a situation where people are convicted on a mere suspicion. So when I'm saying they are not easy, I'm saying that they need to be reported because it's a number of them are not being re reported, we are told. They need to be properly investigated and handled and prosecuted and adjudicated upon. As we close, or we are about to get there, what would be, in your view, the greatest success of our ju judiciary in the, in the last 18 years and what is the biggest challenge going forward? Um, I think the, 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 the best, biggest success by, by our judiciary has been to portray itself as the champion of human rights, as the protector of our constitution and the protector of our democracy, and ensuring that people enjoy their rights under the new constitution. It is, after all, the ultimate guardian of the constitution. And I think in that regard, it has acquitted itself well. Well, as regards challenges, well, they continue. The same challenges continue. They, they are new developments every time that come. But I think the judiciary needs to make sure that uh, it retains its credibility. And it, it, it should not overstep its marks. It must operate within its turf, as the executive must also operate within their turf and the legislature. So it is important that uh, that kind of um, uh, interrelationship, respect is maintained. Justice Bernard Ngopi, thank you very much for joining us tonight. You're welcome. That's it for tonight. Interface will be back again next week. Email us on interface on 3 at sabc.co.za or catch us on Facebook from me, Rems Mabote, and the team is goodbye and good night.